Picture it. After a successful stint in marketing at your current organization, you're at a huge party that your colleagues have thrown for you. It's your farewell gathering. Everyone in the office is there, including your partner and your kids. You take the opportunity to share that you're actually going back to school to pursue your master's in creative writing to fulfill your dream of writing and publishing your own novel. How old are you in this situation? 40? 50? 60? Well, this is exactly what happened to Susan in a chapter of Life Pivoting. And her age? 67. It is people like Susan and many others over the age of 50 with whom I led over 100 hours of ethnographic interviews as a research fellow with the Stanford Center on Longevity to better understand how purpose finding, belonging, and companionship evolve as we age. We are emerging into a new normal of our society. Thanks to medical and technological advancements, we are being afforded an extended lease on life. And this affordance is likely not slowing down as the longevity research movement continues to take shape. Those born today could live well into their hundreds. So it's time we stopped and asked ourselves, 80 could be the new 60, and 60 the new 40. If so, how can we meaningfully transform societal norms to get the most out of this extended lease on life, and more importantly, ensure that these extra years are accessible to everyone? Beyond my role as a longevity researcher, I come to you today first as a concerned, yet hopeful, son, grandson, and neighbor. Second, as the founder and CEO of a longevity startup, Goldie, working to address the social isolation and loneliness epidemic's effects on older adults. And third, well, as a hopeful 89-year-old man myself, here's hoping. <laughs> I am fascinated by what these extra years of life can mean for us if all of us are able to access them. Combining the insights gathered from my interviews with extensive market research and personal reflection, each of us needs to understand that of course, building the world that we want our children to be born into is paramount, but equally as important is building the world that we want our children and ourselves to age in too. Of course, there is a much bigger conversation on what must be done to address socioeconomic hardship, discrimination, access to healthcare, and other systemic inequities affecting the lives of millions. Today, I focus on one aspect of that system, which is aging. The opportunities, the challenges, the privileges, and the work to be done. Acknowledging that, it's time we start adhering to the new 80-20 rule. Whether you're older or younger, 80 or 20, we all have skin in the game and agency over what we do about this aging dilemma, as age is an aspect of our identity that is evolving every second of every day. So, where do we start? Let's dive into understanding demographic shifts and trends in the longevity movement, then drill into the needs and opportunities of the older adult population and longevity economy, and conclude with understanding what we can do now as business and community leaders to promote a more amazing older adult life for ourselves and for those living it now. By 2034, there'll be more people 65 and above than 18 and below for the first time in US history. This shift is more than just numbers. It is a call to action to address the changes necessary for the paradigms that govern our lives. The distinction between lifespan and health span becomes crucial. Lifespan looks at the number of years we're given, while health span looks at the quality of those years, enhanced by access to things such as medicine, healthcare, and social determinants of health like transportation, education, and social connection. In the years ahead, we must align health span and lifespan to move forward public policy and corporate initiatives with intentionality as we cultivate an age-positive culture and an age-ready society. How will universities roll out new degree programs to cater to a population 30 or 40 years removed from the classroom? How will financial institutions adjust their retirement investment strategy to account for 15, 20, or 30 extra years of later life payouts? More importantly, how can we support the over 40% of US older adults that depend on social security as their sole source of income? And what's to come of the millions of others that currently have no retirement reserves? Are we to do nothing and hope for the best? Or is this our call to action to stand up as the change makers and innovators we know ourselves to be and do something about it? On all ends of severity, these questions are bubbling up faster than we have time to respond, yet we must start addressing them. On a different note, the traditional life arc, born, learn, work, retire, is evolving. We are being afforded the opportunity for multiple careers, multiple chances to return to school, 
multiple doorways to reinvention of our lives. It is becoming less about seeing how high up the ladder we can climb and finding two or three vistas relevant to our passions and talents. Of course, the key challenge here is ensuring that this opportunity is accessible to everyone and not just the wealthy and able-bodied. Take Kristen, age 56, for example, who used her newfound identities as both an empty nester and a recently demoted employee to launch a new support group for new parents in her community. And in this opportunity, found a path to becoming a licensed postpartum counselor, launching her own practice, and paving a way for financial independence into the chapters she still had ahead. Of course, the opportunity for reinvention is valuable in itself, but when we can make it easier and more meaningful for people to work longer if they so choose, it's a win-win for the person as much as it is the economy for the financial opportunities created. On the topic of finances, the older adult population is not a burden, but a boon. The 60 and up population alone accounts for over half of annual U.S. consumer spending. Yet, le less than 10% of marketing budgets are spent on winning this group over. Even worse, less than 5% of advertising images depict someone over the age of 50. Of course, the images that we do see normally depict a Gen Z or millennial like me teaching that person how to use technology. <laughs> The fact is, digital fluency acquired by this population over the last 10 years has transformed the rules of engagement. In the last 10 years alone, smartphone utilization has increased from 13% to 61%, and this trend spikes and continues onward post-COVID. Zooming out, healthcare stands to be one of the industries most transformed by longevity. The ballooning 65 and up population is transforming resource priorities including the not often discussed build treatment of social isolation, a $7 billion annual Medicare expense, and addressing loneliness, which accounts for over $960 billion in lost economic productivity annually. As Mitchell, an 83-year-old retired accountant said to me, the hardest words to muster up the courage to ask when you've been removed from social systems for so long are, will you be my friend? So, what do we do now? We must rewrite the narrative of aging from one of inevitability to one of possibility. And in doing so, here are three things we can immediately start to do to make these changes. First, we must incentivize meaningful engagement of older adults in the workplace. And a great place to start is rolling out such benefits as fractional work arrangements, later life education stipends, and caretaker coverage. We must prioritize the creation and management of intergenerational teams, ensuring that we can dismantle both ageism and age-based hierarchy. We must value wisdom and experience equally alongside youth and innovation. Second, we must do the introspective work of understanding what multiple chapters or vignettes would look like in our own lives, because doing that planning now normalizes these shifts later. And third, in everything that we do, we must maintain an emphasis on improving the UX of life. This can range from broad-based urban planning initiatives like increasing crosswalk times with the extra push of a button, like done in Singapore. It can also look like rolling out later life education, vocational, and volunteer training programs like in New Zealand. Your identity as a future older adult gives you agency and responsibility to get involved with designing a better later life. Yet, it is no substitute for involving the voice of those actively living this life stage in decisions made today. Empathy and curiosity here are key. So, whether or not you want to become a spicy romance novelist like Susan, or a community counselor like Kristen, the future has the potential to be brighter than ever if we can dismantle these roadblocks and inequities in our way today. I urge you to see the value ahead in our 70s, 80s, and 90s with the same openness and enthusiasm that we have long put into our 20s, 30s, and 40s. Your future self will thank you today for what comes well past tomorrow. In the wise words of Jane Fonda, age 86, you couldn't pay me to be 20 again. <laughs> it's never too late. Never too late to start over and never too late to be happy. Together, let's start living this new 80-20 rule, acknowledging and accepting every chapter on the road ahead with grace and gratitude. In with the old and out with the antiquated story of aging. Thank you. Thank you.